All right, so welcome everybody. This is Essential Lessons for Photographing Trees and Forests with Sarah Marino, Alex Noriega, and TJ Thorne. Um, these guys are not only colleagues, but good friends of mine. So this is very exciting that um, Sarah's gathered everyone here today to talk about this. We really appreciate everybody participating in this webinar today. We chose this topic because since we're all, or most of us are staying close to home these days, we wanted to choose a topic that could help you see some new opportunities in your immediate environment. So since most of us have access to trees and sometimes access to forests and green spaces, we thought that we could give you three different perspectives on photographing trees and forests today. So that was the main reason for choosing this topic. And I'm so glad to be joined by my friends, Alex and TJ, because they have two of the best portfolios of trees around. So I think it's, uh, it's hopefully going to be a, a session full of inspiration and lots of ideas that all of you can take forth and um, hopefully practice some tree and forest photography soon. So before we get started, we will do some quick introductions. Um, I'll start. And so my name is Sarah Marino and my photography business is Nature Photo Guides. My photography mostly focuses on nature's small scenes, so things like intimate landscapes, portraits of trees and plants and flowers, and abstract renditions of natural subjects. Um, I also enjoy doing black and white photography and the grand landscape as well, but my focus is mostly on nature's small scenes. I also write eBooks and do video tutorials and teach workshops, um, particularly with David and Jennifer, who are, uh, so David, Kingham and Jennifer Renwick of Exploring Exposure are here today to help us with the technical side and hosting, but they're also both fantastic photographers on their own, and I do workshops with the two of them. Um, I'm based in southwestern Colorado in a little town at the base of the San Juan Mountains, so if you're passing through this part of the country uh, for fall colors, that's kind of where I live, uh, and then I travel part-time in an Airstream with my husband all around the western United States, so I, I get a little bit of home time in the San Juan Mountains, and then a little bit of away time in our RV. So uh, really appreciate you all being here today. And with that, we can turn it over to TJ. All right, um, <laughs> my name is <clears throat> TJ Thorne, and my business is TJ Thorne Photography. Um, I tend to focus on uh, the calming simplicity that I find in nature. I have a pretty deep and emotional relationship with nature and I go to nature to find that simplicity and solace and a bunch of other things that I'll talk about. So that's kind of what starts to come through my photography. Um, I live in the Pacific Northwest, uh, just outside of Portland, Oregon, and most of my business is uh, in-field workshops that uh, some of them I run with Alex. Um, those are always pretty fun. And yeah, if you check out my work, you would potentially notice the simplicity in it. It's usually uh, just like one or two or three elements, um, just distilling down uh, my experience in nature to the things that I love and capturing them in photographs. So that's all I really have to say about it right now. All right. Um, I'm, did it pull me up then? Yeah, I'm Alex Noriega and I'm a professional nature photographer. I travel full time. Although right now I've been grounded for a while due to COVID, um, but I live with my girlfriend in a travel trailer and we travel around the US uh, living and photographing in national parks and national forests and public lands. And uh, my photography has over time become a lot more focused on small scenes, but I still try to imbue them with kind of a bold um, element or bold presentation so I'm not shooting many grand scenes but I am still trying to make eye-catching images that uh, kind of convey a sense of mystery and spark your imagination so that's my goal with my photos so here on the screen you can see our websites and our names so if you'd like to look up more information about each of us after the session and we'll give this information at the end as well so just a little bit more context about us and our photography I also wanted to mention that I have another upcoming webinar with David Kingham, Jennifer Renwick, and me, and we are going to be doing composition case studies. So looking at some of our small scenes photographs, so intimate landscapes, abstracts, portraits of plants and trees, and those kinds of subjects, and we'll talk through some of the ideas behind our compositions. 
So we hope that you'll consider joining us for that. And that is on Thursday, June 11th at 4 p.m. Mountain Time. And I'm going to send out some information, uh, the recording of this session and some notes from our discussion today after the webinar. And I'll also include a link for you to register. So if you're interested, that will be an easy way for you to participate. So our goals for today, as I mentioned before, we chose this topic because it is particularly relevant to our current situation where most of us are staying close to home or we're not traveling much and we are looking for opportunities to be creative and, and exercise our photographic muscles close to home. So today we decided on talking about trees because that's something that we all have access to or most of us have pretty easy access to in our immediate environment. So trees are often a really chaotic subject with lo a lot going on. If you look at a forest environment, it's at first glance, it's beautiful, but it's also messy and chaotic. So one of our focus areas for today is going to be offering some ideas for how you can organize the chaos of trees and forests into cohesive and interesting compositions. And then the three of us are going to each talk a little bit about our creative process and our philosophical approach to photography. So although the, the three of us are, 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 have some pretty similar habits, we all come at photography differently. So we thought that it would be helpful for us each to share our different perspectives so that you can get three or insights into the way that the three of us look at the same subject, but a little bit differently. And then the bottom line is we hope that we'll inspire you to see some new opportunities, both in terms of compos composition and subject matter, just ideas that you might not have tried before. So hopefully by the end of this webinar, uh, we, we will accomplish these four things. These are the five lessons that we are going to go over. So Alex will talk about the first two, so how structure can bring order to chaos, and then the power of exclusion. And then TJ will talk about working with any light under any conditions and how you can find opportunities during any season. And then I'll talk about looking for smaller scenes in grand landscapes. So with that, we can head over to Alex. All right. Uh, is the full screen presentation up? Yep, it is. All right, so lesson one, structure brings order to chaos. Um, trees are, let me just hide the zoom window here. Trees and forests are inherently chaotic. They're naturally chaotic. Uh, you have twigs and foliage and underbrush and, and fallen trees and, and branches hanging down. And, and leaves and you have all sorts of elements in the forest and it tends to be very chaotic and this can make it really difficult to shoot at times. I think the forest is probably the most challenging thing that I shoot but it's also the most gratifying to pull together in an ordered way that works for your composition. So what I want to talk about is structure because this will grab and direct the viewer's attention so that you can make sense out of the chaos essentially and give your viewers something um, something of an anchor so that they can explore the chaos around the structure. So um, trees have inherently strong visual structure and I'll get into that. They um, have trunks which are very uh, simple compared to the chaos surrounding them and they have the kind of branching dendritic patterns of the of the branches that come out. Um, so trees will lend structure to a forest scene, but even with that, it's not always that simple to uh, make a cohesive composition. So I wanna give you some examples of structure that you can find in various forests and with trees in different situations uh, so that you can get some ideas on how to, how to distill this chaos down to an ordered composition. So first thing and the most obvious thing are the tree trunks themselves. They're straight lines, they're vertical. Um, if you take a look at this scene from the redwoods, I mean, all of this green underbrush is very chaotic and all of the branches coming off the trees are pretty chaotic. We've got light hitting the trees over here and then backlight over here through the fog. There's a whole lot going on in the scene, but because of the structure of the trunks themselves, um, the scene is lent a sense of order and it's almost, calming to me, even though there's so much going on, um, I'm able to use these trunks 
as kind of an anchor, a visual anchor, so that I can explore everything around them. And so this is also repetition of a pattern, you know, the vertical uh, trunks arc sort of forming a pattern there. And I've just kind of spaced them out in a way that felt balanced to me. I'm not a big fan of these overlapping trees in the middle, but um, that's a decent example of the trunks. And then here's another, an aspen forest in the fall. Now, these forests are kind of, I mean, you love the color when you're there. You love to see all these leaves kind of almost floating in the air because they're just filling the forest and the color is amazing and the light can be amazing, but you need some sort of structure to make sense out of it all. I have a photo from this exact scene that's more just the lush uh, leaves of all the trees surrounding this area, and there isn't much structure to it. I felt that this was a better shot because it had all these kind of uh, tree trunks here to lend a visual structure. And here's another obvious example where the trunks are actually what the image is. The trunks are the composition. It's just kind of this repeating vertical pattern. And so our eyes look for patterns and they look for order in the chaos. Um, the human brain is a great uh, recognizer of patterns. And so we're always looking for patterns. We're always looking to make sense out of what we're seeing. And tree trunks are just the easiest way to do that especially in a forest with a lot of trees. And then here's another example of it, except I'm kind of using them as silhouettes. So we're seeing through the trunks, but they're still providing the story in combination with the title, Imprisoned. It kind of looked like a jail cell to me. Um, and it's simplifying this chaos in the background, all these branches crisscrossing on top of one another and the different colors of the leaves uh, playing off the brush behind that. It was a pretty chaotic scene, but if we just distilled down to this one section, these trunks gave the composition chaos, or sorry, gave the composition order among the chaos. So tree trunks, pretty obvious. This is kind of, this is my favorite thing about trees, the branches. So dendritic patterns, dendritic just means of or pertaining to a tree. Uh, the pattern is kind of this branching, uh, pattern where every branch has another couple branches that come off it and so on and so forth. So start with the trunk and then it just kind of branches off each one into its own path. And so the eye really likes fractals, like the human brain loves fractals. This is an example of a fractal where you kind of have the same shape repeated, smaller and smaller. Um, you have this kind of branching pattern and then on each branch you have further branches. The eye loves fractals, the eye loves patterns, and the eye loves lines to follow. So when you're looking at an image like this, it's inherently pleasing already because you love to see the patterns and you love to follow these lines through the image. So this is a shot that's just focusing on the dendritic pattern of the tree and kind of the sky and the leaves are just the backdrop for it. Here's another example of that also using the trunks, but more focused on the dendritic patterns in these trees, just kind of how they all branch up and, and form that uh, flowing shape as they go up. And I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of these straight trunks here, the way that they kind of stand counter to the um, dendritic patterns in the middle trees, but I still thought it worked because these trunks were creating a frame to kind of center your eye on these main trees here. So it's a pretty chaotic scene, but I've brought structure to it by using the trunks and the dendritic patterns. And I've processed it in a way that they're darker, so they stand out as almost silhouettes. And it's pretty obvious when you look at it right away what the composition's about. It's about these trees and their shape, and then kind of the light and the color of the leaves is secondary to that. And here's an example of a very chaotic scene. Um, this is, I mean, looking at this outside of the, the camera frame, it was one of the more junky, I would say, places that I've seen. I mean, just tons of trees and fallen branches and brush all mingling together, and it just didn't really look like much of anything when we first came up to this location. But these dendritic patterns in the tree and the trunks themselves kind of lent the chaos a bit of order so that you have somewhere to go 
somewhere to return to as you're exploring the scene. So this is this is an example, I guess, of embracing the chaos. I'm I'm using the chaos to my advantage because that is what the shot is. It's all about the detail and those branching patterns, but I've still got some form of order here to bring you back so it doesn't just look like nothing. It's it it looks purposeful. And then here's an example of a dendritic pattern that isn't a tree. It looks like a tree, but you'll find these patterns all over in nature. And I know this is about trees, but I just wanted to mention that you can find these everywhere. And it's sort of a fractal um, branching pattern. You can find it in washes like this. You can find it all throughout the universe actually. But as a nature photographer, just know that this is a an inherently pleasing kind of pattern to find. And I really like to use those. So a common motif with a lot of photography, I think, is the lone tree. And you might normally see it as, as kind of a, a strip at the bottom of the screen, the land, and then one little tree sticking out and then kind of a vast expanse. I'm, I'm not a fan of that particular motif, but I do love to use single trees when they stand out. And so this scene here was pretty chaotic. If you look in the background and look closely, you can see all these different trees and all the trees even to the right and left of the actual subject. There's a lot going on here. So I had fog on my side and I had the fact that this one tree happened to be a little offset from the rest of them and it was catching the light coming down. And this lone tree formed the basis of the composition. And I processed it in a way that emphasized that and everything else just kind of falls away in its nice details. Now I've been through this, uh, this same place in the summer without this fog, without the snow, and it's just utter chaos. It doesn't look like anything. You see this tree and it doesn't stand out at all. So that's something TJ is going to get into about the light and conditions in his presentation. But the lone tree is a very powerful um, compositional technique. And here's another example of it from Zion National Park. And what I did here was just exposed dark enough that it was all about the light on the tree and the background just kind of fell away. So just making the subject all about this one tree. It's very effective if you find an interesting tree and I think there are a lot of great trees out there. Either they can be windswept or they can be gnarled like this one. Um, something else I like to do with the lone trees is I like to kind of fill the frame with them and make the image about that tree rather than the tree being within the scene, making the composition be the tree itself. Like I want you to know everything about this tree and nothing else. So the story of this image for me is just how gnarled and weathered this tree is and the weather actually lent to that story with the snow in the winter. And if you look at it a little more basically, you can see that major junctures in the tree kind of fall roughly on the thirds of the image. I don't really follow rule of thirds, but sometimes when an image works, you can look at it and see that these rules or guidelines of composition do sometimes apply. And maybe that's part of why the image is working. So when you get close and tight on a tree, you can use these junctures and these splits in the patterns and kind of place them in prominent positions in the composition. And that just gives it a more balanced feel and makes it more interesting visually. And here's another example of the lone tree. So there was a lot of other trees against this uh, kind of silvery gray wall next to this, but by focusing on this one, I've told you how lush it is. I mean, you can see the branches are almost wrapping around and enveloping it on all sides, even on the bottom. Um, and just how it's kind of tucked away against the wall. If I had taken a picture of the entire wall full of trees, then this would not be nearly as powerful a composition and you wouldn't have this strong visual path or this anchor of the branches here and the trunks either. So I really like to focus in on lone trees rather than put them in a gigantic environment where they become small. I like to make the small subject, the tree, big and important. I'm sorry, are we stopping for questions during or are all these coming after? All after, Alex. Okay. And so another example of structure, uh, we talked about trunks, we talked about branches and dendritic patterns. Uh, we talked about the lone tree and now light. 
you can't really predict what light's going to do in the forest. It can do all sorts of things, especially in combination with clouds passing overhead. But light can form compositions and create compositions and highlight certain subjects and make an image that would otherwise be way too chaotic. So light can bring order to the chaos. And that's what it's done here. Um, actually, I was with TJ and our friend Ted when we shot this, and um, there were clouds passing over. So we just waited for the spotlight to land right on this one interesting tree. And there were clouds kind of creating shadow all of the other areas in the scene. So we just have the spotlight forming this composition. This tree becomes the star of the show. And it was just way too chaotic when there was light everywhere. So I would say a lesson to take from that is to be patient when you're in the forest and watch the light as it changes because the forest canopy is creating shadows and spotlights all the time and you don't know what clouds could be overhead creating different light also. TJ is going to get more into light in his presentation. So, um, Also, I want to point out these two trunks on the sides. I'm kind of combining the use of light with that use of the trunks for order. Um, but I'm using the trunks to provide kind of a frame because they're so rigid, you're kind of focused on this um, this interestingly shaped gnarled zigzag of a tree rather than the straight trunks. They're just providing a frame, like you should look here, look between here and here. So that's an example of bringing order to chaos. That was a very chaotic scene. Another example of light bringing order to chaos. Um, th this This hillside shot would work without the light, but I think by highlighting a single tree, waiting for that light to just pass over that one tree became a lot stronger. And here's an example of a shot that would have no order without the light, because then all of these background trees, you can hardly see them, and all of these boulders, and all of the wildflowers and grass, everything would be kind of equally important in the frame. But by waiting for this light, where it was coming from the back, and just kind of focusing on these trees, um, it brought a lot of order and structure to an otherwise chaotic scene. Here's another example of light forming something simple out of a kind of complex scene. There's a lot going on, but because the light is so much stronger than everything else, that's what it becomes about. So structure from chaos, the tree trunks, the dendritic branching patterns, you can focus on lone trees, you can focus on light, what light is doing. And then thinking outside the box, it's funny, I should say, this is a leading line, so it's one of the most basic compositional elements, but thinking outside the box, I'm not trying to find a single tree here. I'm just trying to take the entire rainforest and distill it down into a thing that you can interpret visually and you know where to look. So you can use leading lines even within a forest if you can find something like this fallen vine maple. And thinking outside the box a little, this is a hanging branch, just one branch of the tree. The tree was interesting, but I thought that just the branch itself made an interesting composition as well. So just one hanging branch kind of coming down from the tree can make a shot. Likewise, these are several hanging branches, but I actually flipped the image upside down so it looked like they're kind of reaching up. Um, and again, just focusing on some element that has order or structure, like these these dark branches. The leaves in the background, because they're such a different color and luminosity, stand out, and you see this structure, these kind of branches reaching in. There's a lot you can do with trees. And so here's one from Zion National Park that I called Creation of Cottonwood because I thought it was so similar to this Michelangelo painting on the Sistine Chapel. I just thought it looked like this tree was reaching to that one and they were kind of catching light and the wall behind them was dark. So think outside the box. There's images that can be made. I mean, maybe a reference to something or maybe just an interesting shape, but you don't actually have to shoot the entire tree. And so that brings me to lesson two, the power of exclusion. This is something I give presentations on. I'm big on it. Um, I incorporate it in my photography because if you exclude the context to your scene, you can give it a sense of mystery or an atmosphere that otherwise wouldn't be there if the viewer could see everything about the scene. And you empower your subject by making it the star rather than just a detail within the scene. 
So these trees in this snow field, if I had included Mount Rainier behind them, the trees wouldn't be the focus of the image. Uh, Mount Rainier would be, and these would just be a detail. So by focusing in and excluding the context, now you don't know because of the way I've framed this. You don't know that Mount Rainier is up there. You don't know that there are other trees outside the frame. You don't know how far this snow field extends. Now these trees become the star and the snow field becomes the star. And obviously this is a very simple scene because of winter, um, because of the snow there. But in general, the lesson here is to simplify the chaos by excluding unnecessary elements. So if you have like the sky poking through the canopy, maybe you can exclude that. Um, in this case, I excluded an entire mountain and it became an image just of the trees. So I wanted to talk about a little different of an example of exclusion. Um, this is a reflection shot, but I flipped it upside down so that you're seeing the trees right side up. And because of the reflection and the ripples on the lake, it kind of lends it this painterly feel. But because it's right side up, I've actually excluded an element of context. I haven't told you flat out that this is a reflection shot. By flipping it right side up, now you're thinking, is this a painting? What's going on with these trees? Why do they look this way? And then you have to think about it for a second. So I think that gives it kind of a sense of mystery to exclude the context of the fact that it is a reflection shot and to exclude the shoreline, which would be right down here at the bottom. Um, and just, just kind of focusing in on what was most interesting about the scene. Here's another example of excluding context. And what I did here is I excluded the sky and I exposed so dark that you can't even see the background. You can't see what's behind these trees because the light on the trees relative to the background was so bright that what I've done is excluded even the context of what's behind the trees. And it's just really all about the light. And then we have these repeating patterns of the trunks from lesson one. And it's just leaves and trunks and light. I mean, it's very simple. Now, if I had ex included some of the foreground, like the flowers that were right in front of me and the background by uh, exposing brighter and the sky, if I had framed a little wider, then this wouldn't have any sense of mystery. It wouldn't seem mysterious. But by excluding all of that, I'm able to give you an interpretation that is mysterious in my mind. So I wanna show you some practical examples of exclusion in the field by showing you some of my favorite shots and how they came to be. So I've got three of these for you. Example one, here is a completely average mountain scene. I mean, it was amazing to be there, but this photo right here, anyone would take that photo. Anyone standing at this lake would take this reflection shot. It's, it's very simple, very obvious um, motif. But what I was drawn to in this scene was these trees here and the light on them. And you can see that although they are kind of standing out against the hill, they don't look all that interesting. I mean, they're kind of straight. There's maybe four or five of them. They don't look especially remarkable. But by excluding the context of the lake, the mountains, and, uh, and the reflection and the sky and all these other trees, and focusing just on what drew my eye, I was able to make a much more expressive image that kind of showcase the character of these trees, which I thought was kind of Susie and Dr. Seuss. They're very uh, curvy. They, they seem to have personality. The light on the trees really made them stand out against that dark background there. So excluding all the context of the scene made a much more powerful image. So you might think when you walk up to a scene like that, the most epic thing I can make is the wide reflection shot. And I'll show you the mountains and I'll show you this crazy sunset and I'll show you how awesome the symmetry of reflections is. And uh, it just would end up being the same image that anyone else would make. So excluding context gave me a more powerful image and I elevated these few trees by doing that. So there's the full image. Here's another example from Yellowstone. Now, what I was drawn to in this scene was the fog around these trees in the background. Actually not fog, uh, steam from the geysers, the geothermal features here. And if I had shown you this entire scene in my shot, 
you'd see that it was kind of a drab overcast day that there wasn't really anything remarkable about where I'm standing. It's just kind of an empty snow field. Yeah, the river is kind of interesting, but it's over there in the mid ground. And really what you want to be looking at here, or what I want to be looking at, because I find it the most interesting, is the way that the steam from these geysers interacts with these trees. So by focusing in on that and excluding everything else, I made what I consider to be an extremely mysterious image and dramatic image because I focused just on these trees and I used that steam like I would use fog um, in my lone tree example earlier. Uh, fog will help you simplify the chaos of the trees behind it here. The chaos of the scene by kind of, um, it, it will obscure the layers in the background. And in this case, the fog playing with the trees, the interplay there, I thought was pretty interesting. So another example of exclusion there. And then for my last example, I want to show you, you know what, I apologize about the image. This is the only behind the scenes image I have for the shot. And I was living out of my truck at the time for about a month um, on the road photographing. And apparently I was living on gas station snacks. I don't really remember why I set this on here for the shot. Uh, but this whole scene here, we've got a couple dirt roads. We've got a little kind of campsite there you can see behind the camera. We've got a rather unremarkable gravel hill here. Those, those hills in the background, they're kind of they're kind of interesting. They have one nice stripe going across them, but I don't think, as far as badlands go, I don't think they're that interesting. What I was drawn to here were these trees and the gnarled shape of them. So way in the background here is where I found one of my favorite shots, Rainbow Rider. And I've excluded the context completely. I haven't told you that, you know, 10 feet in front of my frame here, there's a little dirt circle where you can camp or that just outside the top of the frame, there are these striped hills because they would be a distraction. Um, and if you just look on the right side of the overall scene, you see all this dirt, but you see how lush and rainbow the foreground is on the actual shot. Well, I've focused on a particularly lush section right below that tree there. So I've excluded all these things that would just detract from the image and made it all about this one tree and that branching dendritic pattern and then the colors of the brush supporting it. And so I hope that these examples have been helpful to show you how you can take a big scene and make something huge out of one small part of it. And I think that's all I've got. Yep. Very well done, Alex. Thank you. Are we just rolling into me, Sarah? We are just rolling into you, TJ. All right, it's good time. So you and your t tree puns, we were promised tree puns. Oh, I'm trying to branch out from, from puns. <clears throat> Sorry. All right. Um, so can you guys see my screen? Yes. And do you see my slideshow presenting? Yes. And do you see my mouse moving around? No on the mouse. No on the mouse? All right, well, whatever. That's not what I wanted to do yet, hold on. All right, so uh, yeah, everyone, uh, thanks for uh, taking the time to join in. Um, my first lesson is going to be about finding opportunity in any lights, in any weather, in any conditions. And my second lesson is going to be about finding opportunity no matter the season. The first I want to share with you, uh, which you already saw, um, the word that changed everything for me. And this word is integral to my photography. Um, it's, I, I talk about it a lot. Um, it, I think a lot of people can benefit from the word. So, um, and it's not really so much the word as it is the mindset. And once I change my mindset to be based around this word, I found a much deeper connection to my images and uh, ultimately much more fulfillment as an artist. And the word is, uh, let's get there, it's explore. Um, like I said, I say it a lot and you know, to the point where a lot of people are probably gonna get sick of hearing it. But again, it's such a powerful word to me and I think a lot of other people can benefit from it. 
So, you know, I don't care. I'm going to keep saying it. And you're probably going to hear it a lot. Do you guys like that? Spend a lot of time on it. Um, so, but what do I mean when I say the word explore? You know, I think that you can take it in a lot of different directions and maybe one that's personal to you. But for me, it's, uh, uh, it's about thinking about photography, not as the act of taking photos, but more as the tool that I use to explore the world around me in an intimate way. And that accomplishes a few things for me. First, it enables me to focus on experiencing the moment without external pressure of getting a photo. Um, this is otherwise known as abandoning the, as a, <clears throat> abandoning the results driven approach. You know, I seek so many things in nature. I seek solace, peace, inspiration, gratitude. And if I'm not making those the priority of being outside in nature, I completely miss them. I'm so focused on getting a photograph and being upset if I don't get a photograph or, you know, um, just, I, I'm so involved in the process of making the photograph that I completely miss out on the experience of what I actually want to find. Second, it encourages me to react to what nature is giving me and spend some time with it. You know, I think of the time that I spend in nature and the things that I'm photographing as serendipitous gifts almost. You know, every decision that I made in life led me to that moment to interact with that thing. Um, so it's like, it's almost like that moment and that experience is there for me. So I wanna make sure that I'm giving it the attention that it demands and also just kind of deserves. Can't get Alex's picture out of the way. Oh, there we go. Um, sorry. It's all right. I don't know why I was there. Third, I get to build intimate relationships with those moments. You know, think about how many trees you have passed in your lifetime, you know, a lot, right? But there are certain trees that, that you remember that you know because they've called out to you and you've spent some time with them. And whether you're, you sit under it, you hike past it on a frequent hike that you do, you drive past it on your way to work um, or whatever, you know, it calls to you and you spend time with it physically or emotionally um, to the point where you have a, a bit of a familiarity with it. And that's kind of how I feel about specific trees that I photograph or just any subject that I photograph in general. Um, if I had not spent time with them, they just kind of remain anonymous and part of the surroundings. But since I did choose to spend time with it and it called to me, you know, I've almost kind of made a friend. And when I go back to locations where I've done that, you know, they could just be a pullout on the side of a river where, you know, I experimented and explored this tree branch that was hanging over the river. I look at that branch every single time. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm revisiting a friend. Fourth, it results in me creating more personal and meaningful work. You know, most of the time when I'm in nature, I don't get a shot to put in my portfolio. And yeah, I have a lot of photos and I take a lot of photos and most of them don't work out, but they all mean something. They're all, they're all reflective of that time that I spent with that subject. They're all part of the experience. So when I do have a photo that makes it into my portfolio, um, that's visually pleasing and emotionally engaging to me, it's a representation of a, that experience that was personal and meaningful, and thus that makes my photography personal and meaningful. And I think what the three of us are all kind of getting at in this webinar is that there are always opportunities to engage with the landscape through your camera. You know, and it's tough at first, it's overwhelming. When we first start on a creative journey, we don't know exactly what tickles our fancy. You know, we're, photographing mountains and we're probably doing cityscapes and portraiture and all these different things. Um, we just, we just kind of know that we enjoy nature and then we enjoy photography. So we combine the two and take photos of pretty things. And it's usually a low hanging fruit of iconic locations, classic compositions, ideas from others that have inspired us, but our real creativity shines when we get to the point where we start to understand the things that touch our soul and we explore them through our camera and find visually pleasing ways to tell um, the story of us individually being in nature. And I can guarantee you that no matter what the kind of light is happening and no matter what conditions are happening, that there's something in nature that you're drawn to. Um, and your task as a photographer is to find a way to put that into a visually pleasing format. So I'll show you a couple images um, where I worked with what kind of the light that I was given to create images that I really like. This first image, uh, it's titled Taller Than the Trees. It's one of my absolute favorite shots. You know, there's, even before I was into photography, um, and I tell the story um, sometimes, and I think I have it written as the caption of this photo, but when I moved to Oregon back in 2001, and I was driving through the Columbia River Gorge, a place that's known for its lush moss, 
I was so drawn to the moss. It was like a fairy tale to me. And ever since then, you know, like moss has been just, it's just been something that's really touched me. And on a lot of my drives, you know, especially going out to the coast, uh, there's this one forest that the sun is just always shining through and backlighting this moss and it's glowing. And it's just like, I'm like, wow, it was just so amazing to me. So I've always been on the lookout for a photo. I've always tried to capture a scene that kind of communicated my wonder for the moss and how, how much I like appreciated it and loved it and how just dramatic and engaging it was to me. And this is the first photo I've done it. And I've tried shooting moss so many times. So it took me a couple years. And um, so this, for, for this particular scene, you know, earlier in the day, my girlfriend and I were out on the coast. I think we were rock hounding or just, you know, trying to get out of the city. And it actually looked like there was a decent sunset to be happening, but we had a decision. Do we stay at the beach and shoot sunset or, and then drive back in the dark? Or do we kind of like take our time and follow one of our favorite roads that follows one of our favorite rivers back to the city? And, you know, we love rivers and we love trees. So we opted to leave the beach um, and drive on the road. And as we were sneaking on this road, uh, the light just kind of kept pouring in through the valley and we got to this point where this scene was just like calling out to me. So we stopped the car and I spent a lot of time with this scene and kind of like what Alex says is that uh, you have a lot of these structure, the structure is being created by these dark shadows and these dark trunks. You know, there's a little bit of the light going on, um, but the light is what's enabling the shadows to stand out and the shadows are basically the structure of this tree. And I just love the way it just felt like almost like it kind of reminds me of like a church, like a chapel and the, the roof is just kind of like alcoving overhead. And I don't know, I guess that's kind of how I think about nature is like, you know, I'm not a religious person, but um, when I'm in nature, it's like a very spiritual experience for me. It's a very emotional experience for me. And when I look at this photo, it takes me back to that moment. Um, and I look at it again, like I look at this scene, every time we drive that road, I look at the scene, it's never looked like that. Um, so it just happened to be there at the right time, in the right place. Like I said, every decision that I've made in life, moving to Oregon, um, deciding to go to the coast that day, deciding to leave the coast that day and drive this road, like every decision leads me to these moments that are there for me. This is a photo of, uh, it's a midday photo um, of some soft backlight in the redwoods. So instead of uh, focusing on using the light and the shadows to kind of create structure, I more used, uh, the light to kind of create a contrast between the back and these, and these uh, golden leaves here. Um, backlit leaves is another kind of thing that really calls me in nature and kind of like how Alex said, they just kind of, kind of look like they're floating. And when you're walking through the forest, it's almost like these lanterns. I have another image titled lanterns, but it's almost these lanterns that are kind of like overhead leading you through the forest. And you know, I spent probably two hours in this forest and, uh, I just got a text. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I probably spent two hours in this forest, you know, photographing the, the redwood trees just, you know, as you would do. But the photo that really meant a lot to me was this one that I got back and it was a really awkward photo to shoot. It was kind of like, the tripod was probably about chest high and I was kind of inside the tree that I was shooting up at. Um, so I'm like, I'll just kind of crouch down with my butt pointed out and a couple people walk past me. I probably look like a fool. But um, Again, it's using that soft backlight to create contrast. So this is that shot type of lanterns that I was talking about. Um, and this was just, uh, this is in Silver Falls State Park in Oregon. And it was just a, a really bright day, but it was partly cloudy. And kind of like what Alex was talking about with the, uh, the tree from Olympic National Park is that the clouds are just allow the sun to peek through every once in a while. And one time it just shone down directly on these leaves. And that's, that's a direct light on the leaves. Um, and since I have the tree trunks in front of them, they're kind of, you know, creating a little bit of a silhouette and giving the image a little bit of structure. But I really, I was just really drawn to the light. The light is the thing that catches my eye more than anything else. So this image, this is also from Silver Falls State Park. And this is unprocessed, but I'm using it as an example of uh, kind of using the conditions that you're given. You know, we, I, I talked about a lot about light and, you know, I, I can talk a, a lot about uh, shooting in crappy light all day long. Um, but what if you have conditions that aren't necessarily playing to uh, what you want, right? So on this day, you know, I, I really like this photo. I'm probably gonna process it at some point. 
But what I remember about this date was how windy it was. You know, and it, was, it wasn't necessarily an overall windy day, but we had really strong gusts and the trees are just whipping back and forth. And, you know, as photographers, we're like, okay, either I need to boost my ISO so I can freeze the action or I need to uh, um, wait for the wind to stop and then capture, you know, a photo like this, which is what I did. But I was like, you know, the story of this day is the wind and the trees kind of blowing around in that. So what I did was, you know, I think I put on a filter and try to do a bunch of different long exposures, you know, experiment a lot. Um, and kind of what bugged me about this photo and the ones that I was trying was that uh, even though the leaves were um, kind of moving about back and forth, that these trunks in the background, if I was shooting at a smaller aperture, they were still coming through uh, kind of uh, sharp and in focus and they weren't moving very much because they were big trunks. So even though I had a, uh, like a maybe a four stop filter on because it was the middle of the day, um, I stopped down to f5.6 so that um, I can render those background details a little bit softer. And that gave me really short shutter speed, even with, you know, the four stops. So I think it was like a tenth of a second or 20th of a second. I can't remember, but we'll see it here in a second. Um, and so I wasn't getting a lot of movement, but I thought like, what if I did multiple exposures? So I set my camera, it was a, the Nikon D810, I set it to 10 multiple exposures. And I layered 10 multiple exposures of like 1 20th of a second on top of each other. Um, and I got this photo. So this is that same exact scene, you know, and I took a little bit of liberty in the processing, trying to render it in a little bit more pastel, kind of like a little bit more abstract way. But if you zoomed in on this, you know, because it was, they were short shutter speeds all layered over top of each other, you didn't get like that fluid motion. You kind of got like little shifts in the leaves um, and still a little bit of detail. So if you were to look at this photo in great, in a full resolution, you can still see the semblance of leaves and branches and twigs and moss. And, um, you know, this is an example of using the weather that I was given to create an image that I really like that, you know, I, this, this image tells a lot more of the story about that day in nature than the one that I just showed you before. Did. Here's an example of uh, an image from Crater Lake at a private workshop at Crater Lake and it was wildfire season. Couldn't see the lake the whole entire time we were there for this private workshop. We couldn't even see the lake, but what we were seeing was like almost like the smoke was moving through the scene as if it was fog. So I think we spent like, I don't know, an hour, two hours just kind of with our long telephoto lenses propped up on this hill, poking out at these, uh, just these different scenes of trees that were moving in and out of the smoke. And this one really called to me because uh, it's actually a forest that was burned by a previous, uh, a wildfire in a previous year. So it's kind of like the smoke is moving through and kind of revisiting that scene. And it was just a really pleasing composition to me with the uh, kind of like the trees centered on the bottom and then kind of all these different layers moving back through and in a proper viewing environment um, and in print, even up in the, uh, the upper area where it's a little bit more white, you can see some more kind of stanza trunks and stuff. So, you know, the key point, or here, oh, here's some more images that I kind of shot in just really midday or, you know, not, not necessarily the most favorable conditions. The one in the top middle is a uh, intentional camera movement of these aspen trees in broad daylight. Everything else is kind of just a backlit moss taken in the middle of the day as I walked around. So I think the key points from this lesson are to follow the light. You know, the light is doing something interesting all day long. And if you pay attention to it, sometimes it's gonna highlight something for you that um, is gonna be interesting. And if you take the time to explore that through your camera, you can um, get a shot that you really like. Embrace the conditions and use them to your advantage and be open to alternatives, you know. I went to Crater Lake to show somebody uh, how to take photos of Crater Lake, and we came away with photos of trees. And so for this lesson, it continues to kind of play off the same concepts and points that I made in the last, seat, the last lesson, that there is, uh, there's beauty no matter what. You know, we have a huge focus with photography on peak seasons, but why? You know, like obviously it's beautiful, but I also think it's because it's being served up um, rather than, and it's like being served up and presented rather than something that needs to be explored and found and appreciated. You know, we kind of just show up to a scene like, that's a pretty scene, click, click, and then we move on. Um, there's likely, I mean, I'm, I, I'm speaking for myself here, but there's a lot more engagement in the scene when it's something that I have to go find and look for. Um, you know, Albrecht Dura, 
a Reformation period painter said, nature holds the beautiful for artists that, who have the insight to extract it. Thus, beauty lies even in humble, perhaps ugly things, and the ideal which bypasses or improves on nature may not be truly beautiful in the end. Um, and it's the first part of that quote that really speaks to the heart um, of all three of our philosophies, me, Alex, and Sarah, but you know, what does he mean in the second part? Like, how does he define beauty? How do you define beauty? And I think that's a good question to ponder. Um, for me, I kind of take that the word that he's using beauty in that context, not necessarily to mean the superficial, but more the beauty about how those mundane and perhaps ugly things captured our attention and we worked with them in depth. Um, and maybe if we didn't, you know, with those easier, beautiful things, you know, we, we, we have like, we, we go so much more in depth with those ugly things, like I was saying. Um, so you have to think about it more, you have to engage with it more, and you get deeper with both the subject and yourself. And to me, that's the beauty, and that's the beauty that comes through your photos. So it's not that surface level, like, here's a pretty tree, it's here is something that I engaged with that I ended up building a relationship with, and I made something that I'm happy with. There's beauty in that. That's the beauty of creation. Um, and to me, that emotional investment is what takes something from being just a pretty picture to be an expressive photo about you and your time in nature, you know, a photo that represents a deeper moment and isn't just about documenting beauty. So let's look at some examples of that. So this was actually uh, taken on uh, the same day that Alex took his snow wraith photo. We were together and I think somebody asked about um, his photo and whether or not it had effects applied. And the truth, the, no, um, you know, it was just a really diffuse scene. It was, it was white out conditions with snow. You know, we couldn't see, there's actually a canyon behind this tree that um, sometimes you can see, but when the snow was really heavy, it completely obscured it. And it made this scene about the tree and the snow. If you were to zoom in on this photo, um, you know, first, the first thing that we see is we see this tree and we see the, the dendritic pattern that Alex was talking about. But as we continue to explore the photo, and I kind of think of my photos as like, almost like a play where I have um, three, three uh, characters in it. I have the the star of the show, which is the tree, and then I have supporting characters. And in this photo, it's uh, the snow that's streaking across the branches um, and the little, the little leaves that are kind of still hanging on well into uh, February. So, you know, I, I used the conditions that we were given, which was just white out snow conditions and spent some time with this tree. And I tried a bunch of different shutter speeds. I tried short shutter speeds to freeze the snow. I tried long shutter speeds to um, not have any texture in the show, snow. I tried shorter, longer shutter speeds to uh, kind of get that snow streaking across and that's the one I settled on. Um, but this is like, this photo to me is all about the texture. Here's an example of a photo taken in Olympic National Park um, in early spring, you know, like we think about going to Olympic National Park in the lush spring when the leaves and the ferns and everything's grown and it's just like, it's, it's so overwhelming though, you know, but I think we were here in like March or early April before anything uh, really started to, to uh, get super lush. And one of my favorite things to look at in nature, like I said, is those backlit leaves and, and trees, you know, we really love trees and the structure that, that they provide and the individuality that they have. But in the early spring, right when the leaves start to pop, you kind of get that structure of the tree, but you also get these little hints of light, like kind of like flocking the edge of the branches so they glow. And I'm really drawn to that. And that, that's kind of what's going on in this photo, even though I have a little bit more front light than back light. But, you know, I, I've shot this tree in the spring when it was leafed out and you don't get to see the individuality of this trunk. It's, and this is a really cool looking trunk just completely covered in moss. And when the trees cover up all of that, it's more just a photo of a tree than um, something as interesting as this to me. So here's a scene from the Owens Valley in the Eastern Sierra. Um, and this is a scene that I've shot numerous times. Um, I've shot it both uh, in February and in November. And this is the shot from November. And this isn't processed, this is just the raw file. But I wanna show you the example, you know, like, so this was November, we have the, the colorful leaves going on. It's a pretty scene. Um, but what would it look like without those tree or without the leaves? Would it still be a pretty scene? Would it still be uh, engaging? And to me it was, and this is the photo that I came up with, you know. So what we have going on is this hill behind all the trees and then the mountain kind of peaks up from behind it and just backlit 
backlit all these uh, this brush and uh, these grasses that were in front of it and then in the branches on it too. Um, if you saw this, I know it's probably pretty compressed uh, in zoom, but this image literally glows, the light areas glow, um, especially when printed and lit properly. So, you know, that's something that the other photo doesn't have. You know, the branches are blocking out a lot of that light. And yes, the, or the, the leaves are blocking out a lot of that light. And yes, they are backlit, but they're also kind of creating shadows that I don't like and little dark spots. But this photo was all about how everything was glowing and it's about the texture and about the branches. And that's just something that, um, that didn't come through for me in the November shot. So, you know, February, middle of winter, um, I preferred the shot over that. So here's a photo. Um, this is also from that same river uh, that I showed that um, mossy tree shot in. Um, it was taken almost near, like way, like way after the, or right before it started getting really dark. So, you know, I had to boost my ISO to 800 because I stopped down because I wanted a little bit of depth of field um, and still a little bit of a longer or a shorter shutter speed so that I can get a little bit of texture in the water. But this is like, this is like, the end of autumn when everything's kind of like brown and mushy, but you can still see that down here at the bottom of the frame, and I did the same thing with Alex, I took a reflection and flipped it uh, right side up, or upside down rather, and you can kind of see that there's still a lot of color going on, and if you were to zoom in on the full resolution on this, um, just the way the water is rendering all these different colors, they're kind of like little squares and rectangles and ovals of different colors where all the little deep, different leaves are being represented. And I have a lot more shots of this um, that even aren't the reflection that just kind of, um, it just shows the tail end of autumn. You know, like nature is amazing all year round and everything that happens in nature is happening for a reason. Um, so how can we find the beauty in all those things? So this image is actually from Olympic National Park taken in January, yeah, it was a January. Um, and uh, my girlfriend and I were driving to the Ho Rainforest um, and you, you know, you think of the whole rainforest as like one of the most lush places on earth with just moss hanging from, you know, massive trees and ferns and greens. And it's just like, it's like a rainforest. It's a fairy tale. It's everything that you've ever thought about with, you know, with fairy tales. But as we were driving along the road, we kind of saw these, or my girlfriend saw these stands of alders off to the side and just the way that the trunks were all lined up, kind of like, uh, Alex was talking about with that repetition and the texture of all these tree branches. And again, you zoom in um, on full resolution and all these grasses and branches down here have texture. The tree trunks have texture. There's all texture at the top of this frame and even behind these trees, you know, even though these trees have a lot of texture, um, they're a little bit more white than the texture behind them so they stand out. But this is just an example of going somewhere in a non-peak season and capturing what called to us and that was just the texture and the repetition of these tree trunks. So for the key points for this lesson are to think beyond peak season. You know, we don't always need to get like the most epic autumn colors, the most epic spring greens, the most, uh, the, the highest flow on waterfalls or the perfect flow on waterfalls. You know, some of my favorite waterfall shots are some of the lowest like summer flow when they're barely running. Um, you know, consider and highlight what is unique about that time of the year. You know, it's, it, is it the snow? Is it the textures? Is it the colors? You know, there's, is it the decay? Is it, uh, you know, there's all different kinds of things that happen all during the year. And tell the whole story of nature, not just about life, but also about death and transitions and recovery. You know, like I said, the whole entire cycle of nature is beautiful and woven together so intricately that we wouldn't have those really beautiful peak moments without the not so beautiful moments. And no matter what's happening at any time of the year, nature is doing something amazing. So, you know, as a photographer, engage with that and strive to tell the whole story in a beautiful way. And that's all, all I got. All right. So we're talking about small scenes. So trees are small scenes in intimate landscapes. Now I'm going to talk about even smaller scenes. So I'll be amplifying a lot of the same lessons that both TJ and Alex talked about, but for even smaller subjects. So these are all things that are directly related to trees and forests and things that you can find if you start observing or extend your observations to some of the smaller details. 
So for those of you that have heard one of my presentations before or have heard me talk about my photography, you'll, you've probably heard me talk about this slide. But I think about my photography as having an expansive approach. And I feel like it's, most, it's important to talk about this before I talk about any of my specific photographs. So when people talk about the rules related to nature photography, like photograph during the golden hour and, and use the rule of thirds and things like that, well, sometimes scenes just don't work according to those rules. Uh, the idea that TJ was talking about, about light creating opportunities that are unconventional and Alex talking about how light creates compositions, like those are all things that if you only listen to a rule like photograph during the golden hour, you're missing tremendous opportunities. So I always try to look for opportunities instead of limitations with regards to photography. Uh, that means that I think about things like there's always something to photograph and that I can always make a connection when I'm outside. I love being in any natural setting and being able to make a connection in the moment creates a photographic opportunity. So I try not to go with any preconceived ideas about what the weather's gonna be doing, what the light is going to be doing, what conditions are going to look like, but instead, I want to go into nature with an open mind and make connections with the things that spark my interest or curiosity when I'm there. Um, and then to, to continue on to what TJ was saying, I'm a big believer in the fact that possibilities exist at all times throughout the day, regardless of what's happening in terms of light or weather. Both Alex and TJ showed photographs that were taken in the middle of a snowstorm. So that's a time when a lot of people would pack up and say like this isn't conducive to photography, but they both came away with really inspiring photographs from that, that moment. So possibilities really exist throughout the day if you bring an open mind. And then as TJ was also talking about with the idea of finding beauty in mundane subjects and showing more than just like peak fall color or uh, like a tree in its perfect condition, but there are opportunities to show beauty in decay and the transition in seasons. And a few of my photos will, will amplify that idea as well. So this whole idea of taking an expansive approach to photography increases your opportunities when you're in the field. Another one of the things that I always think about is that observations create opportunities. So the stronger your observation skills, the stronger or the more opportunities you'll find for photographing. Because if you start to see more details and more nuances and more subtleties, you'll be like, oh, that sparked an idea for a composition or it sparked an idea of how I could craft a photograph that I might not have thought about before or that I didn't expect to find today. So we can take this photograph as our example. So this is a, a nice stand of trees on a misty morning in Banff National Park. And we're going to look at this in terms of what's there beyond this scene of trees and the mist. So there are all sorts of things. And these are the types of things I'm going to be talking about. So looking at the smaller details for trees and forests. So things like colorful leaves, the texture on bark, whether that's a standing tree that's living or a fallen tree, uh, things like tiny plants on the forest floor or fallen leaves, uh, mushrooms and slime molds and other types of fungus, that uh, there are tremendous opportunities uh, on the Pacific or in the Pacific Northwest and along the Pacific coast in terms of interesting photographs of mushrooms that are growing in forest environments on trees all over the place and then mosses. So there's all sorts of things once you start looking at the details of nature and all of these little elements can create opportunities for photographs. So that leads to another one of my the things I always think about when I'm out in nature to always be observing. And this can go well beyond just when you're in nature. Uh, always look, be looking at the light, studying what's happening outside your window, uh, thinking about how the weather impacts both what's happening in the sky and what's happening on the land. Uh, because these kinds of observations, again, create opportunities. So for my own photography, when I, uh, when I approach a place, so let's say I walk into a forest, I'm looking at the grand scene in front of me but I'm also looking for scenes within that scene. So that would be what you might call an intimate landscape. And then looking for some of the smaller details. So the things that you really have to spend some time studying a landscape to notice. I'm looking at the light. So what's happening in the sky? What's happening with the land? Little details, like what, where is light hitting the landscape? Where's, where are the shadows interesting? And how could those opportunities be formed into a photograph? 
I'm also thinking about abstractions. So beyond just trees, but instead shapes and forms and light and shadows and contrasts. And so those abstractions help create some of the ideas that can then be formed into a composition. And then I also look for things like surprises. So what about a landscape might be unexpected? Uh, like for instance, I have some photographs of Death Valley National Park that include things like trees and pine cones and pine needles and lichen and uh, wildflowers, like mountain wildflowers. So those are things that you might not expect in a place like Death Valley, but if you go up high enough, you'll find those kinds of things. So those are the kinds of subjects that in a portfolio of Death Valley National Park would be surprising. So those are the kinds of things that I look for when I'm trying to observe the landscape in front of me and then use those observations to see what sparks my interest most and then that draws me towards a photograph. So now I'm going to be talking about some of those little details that caught my attention with forests and trees. So I've, in, or I've separated these things, these five ideas, or these ideas into five sets of photographs so that you can think about them in this organization. It's, there's some overlap for sure, but these five ideas are a nice way to organize some things that you can look for when you go out to photograph trees or forests. So here we have some small collections of leaves, and whether that's a single branch or an interesting pattern among a tree, that there are all sorts of opportunities with collections of leaves. Uh, my husband, who's a, also a nature photographer, and I, we've been spending a lot of time photographing the new green aspen trees around us where we live and doing things like looking up into the canopy and focusing in on one particularly interesting set of leaves is one way to photograph a tree, like a very small part of a tree. So like what Alex was talking about, the power of exclusion. By, by focusing on one really small part of a tree, you're able to bring it to life and show that it's unique and interesting qualities. Uh, the second subject, or the second opportunity is looking for tiny subjects. So these were both taken at the base of conifer trees in two totally different environments. Uh, the one on the left is from the San Juan Mountains in Colorado, and the one on the right is from Jasper National Park in Canada. But they're both little tiny worlds that unless you're looking closely, you're going to totally miss. So by actually looking at the base of trees and seeing the life that lives right around the base of a, a conifer in a forest, you can find all sorts of details that can make for fascinating uh, subjects for photography. The forest floor. So right below where trees are living in a forest, you can find opportunities like a mass of pine cones, uh, the, just the repetition that creates kind of an interesting abstract pattern to uh, these, I can't re remember exactly what these are on the right, uh, but I found these in Mount Rainier National Park. So they look like these little interesting green scallops with little uh, pine needles scattered in, scattered about. So both of these help tell a, a deeper story just beyond the trees, but kind of the, the circle of life. Like do these, the uh, little plant or formations on the right, they probably have some interdependent relationship with the trees that they're living with and that the pine needles that are falling on top of them might provide nutrients but that helps tell an additional story about the place that you're visiting. And then there are so many interesting textures in trees and both Alex and TJ have fantastic collections of photographs of tree bark and other uh, driftwood and other textures related to trees. So if you start looking at tree bark everywhere you go, you'll start seeing opportunities because there's so much detail and abstract formations and shapes once you start looking at tree bark. So these are just a couple of examples. Uh, one of these is the burls on the left was Mount Rainier National Park. And then the example on the right is a piece of driftwood in Olympic National Park. So uh, just these little crazy worlds of patterns once you start looking at the details that are associated with trees. And then finally, uh, I absolutely love the beauty that's found in decay at the end of fall. So people or photographers all often talk about the joy of photographing peak fall colors. I actually really enjoy the end of fall colors. Once the leaves are all on the ground and you start to see a totally different side of fall, that transition from the very end of fall into the beginning of winter. And I think that decay is particularly beautiful. So this is a way of finding beauty in a really mundane subject, like fallen leaves at the end of fall. Um, 
or like in the example on the left, the contrast of the ferns that are still vibrant and green with the fallen leaves that have that are at the end of their lives. Or the same thing with the, the mix of a former wildflower plant and then oak leaves on the right. So being able to see past what I think a lot of people would just be like, that's ugly, an ugly mess on the ground. But sometimes you can actually find a beautiful subject for photography in the decay at the end of a season. So with that, I'll move on to a couple of composition concepts that you can think about when you are potentially looking for smaller details in nature. And two things that I think about when I'm photographing these kinds of scenes is exclusion. So really feeling, filling the frame with your subject and simplification. So those are things that both Alex and TJ also talked about. Really knowing what your subject is and communicating it, uh, communicating the aspects of it that you find most attractive and interesting, and then communicating it in a way that the viewer knows exactly what, what the subject is of the photograph. So whenever I'm photographing small details in nature, I always go back to those foundations of exclusion and simplification. So one of the ways that you can do that is to use shallow depth of field. And this I, always feels like I'm talking about technique, and I almost never talk about technique, but I think that shallow depth of field is an essential composition approach when you're talking about small details in nature, because you can take an incredibly chaotic scene. Like if I had showed you the, like a snapshot of this scene, it just looks like a massive, massive branches. But with shallow depth of field, you can focus in on this little one detail in this alpine birch and say, that's my subject. And then the rest of the scene just provides context. This is another example of Alex's lesson applied to a really small detail in nature. So these are corn lilies, uh, which is a very common plant in the alpine areas of the Western US. And the uh, aspen leaves have a little bit of frost on them. And the corn lilies provide the structure to the composition so that they help organize that chaos into a more cohesive photograph. Repetition and patterns is also another way to organize chaos. This is a little pond kind of in the area where we live. And when you start excluding the details on the edge of the pond, you're able to find an expanse of just the aspen leaves. So looking for repetition and patterns is another way to organize the chaos of nature when you're looking for smaller scenes. And then the focal point, like Alex's Rainbow Rider photograph that he started off with, I'm not sure if it was Rainbow Rider, but the same tree that he started off with, like that that is the key focal point of the photograph. That same lesson can be applied to smaller details, like this sprig of oak leaves here in Colorado. So by focusing just in on this single sprig of oak leaves, I can say that this is the, the element that I want to draw your attention to most. So that's the, the, the key focus of this composition. So those are just a couple of basic composition ideas to think about if you see small scenes in nature. Uh, these are some ways that you can help organize that chaos and then present your subject in a more cohesive way. And then I'll go through five quick ideas so that you can think through some ideas to, to expand your opportunities in nature. So the first, back to what TJ said, be open to all light. There's, there are opportunities at all times during the day and that you might be surprised photographing leaves during the middle of the day when they're translucent. Um, I know in the questions, somebody had asked, well, what do you do when all the leaves are green? I think one of the best things you can do is focus on an interesting set of branches and leaves, have it backlit so this, you're photographing into a source of light like the sun, uh, and the leaves are really translucent and they glow. Uh, or in this particular, in this particular example, you get some dappled light from the mix of the light and shadows. I've mentioned a few times about finding beauty in the mundane. So if you open your mind to opportunities in decay and things that you might not necessarily think initially might make a great photograph, after working with the subject, you might find that it actually can be beautiful when you exclude some of the less attractive details and instead just focus on the thing that drew your eye most. So in this case, I just really liked the little round service berry leaves mixed in with the oak leaves uh, in Zion National Park. Uh, from the first part of my presentation today, just working on improving your observation skills because observation skills breed opportunities. And then all, I think all three of us made it pretty clear, like going into nature with an open mind 
and experimenting to see what you might end up with. That having fun with your camera and experiencing playfulness can sometimes produce unexpected results that are, are fun and different than what you might have expected. So in this case, frustration with the wind uh, turned into, well, the wind is part of this experience. So how can I create a photograph that shows what the wind is like on this particular scene? So if you can't tell at the size, uh, these aspen leaves are fluttering in the wind. Um, and then my final lesson is when you, are when you are photographing very small subjects, you can easily create your own shade. So you'll probably always have a coat with you. So that's often the thing that I defer to because I always have my coat with me. Um, sometimes I can use my backpack to create enough shade so I can get some nice even light over a subject. Or you can choose a more professional choice, uh, but that you don't always have with you. Um, and that's a reflector or a shader, like a, a five in one reflector so that you can create your own shade and get even light or different kinds of light over a small subject. So those are five things that you can think about to extend your ability to photograph small scenes in nature. So an overview of all of the things that we talked about today. I'll do a quick overview and then we'll move on to the Q&A. So structure helps organize chaos, and we showed a lot of different ways that you can think about structure uh, when you're photographing trees and forests, that exclusion and filling your frame is one of the most powerful composition tools when it comes to photographing trees or any chaotic environment. There's always something to photograph if you bring an open mind. We encourage you to experiment and try new things that you might not have tried before. Like if for some of the photos that I showed, if you've never tried shallow depth of field before, that could be something you could try if you're interested in photographing some of the leaves that might be in, a, in your yard or a nearby park. You, don't, you aren't quite interested in the whole tree, but you might find some interesting details uh, once you zoom in and experiment with shallow depth of field. Uh, if you, the more you observe, the more opportunities you'll have for photography. We encourage you to look for details because details, again, can also turn into opportunities for photography. And once you start noticing details, you'll have some ideas about how to re refine your compositions even further. And just generally bring an open mind. Forests are really complicated and chaotic scenes. And if you approach the, the landscape with an open mind and uh, just seeing what is connecting with you most that day, then you can, you can let that connection uh, encourage your creativity and your photographic process. So we have three offers for people who participated in today's session, and I'll quickly talk about those, and then Jennifer will facilitate our Q&A. I have a new ebook coming out on June 10th, and I'm so excited because it has been the complete focus of my life for a long time. This started out as an article for uh, David's Nature Photographers Network uh, website, and he's like, this is maybe a little too long for an article. So now it's like a 120 page ebook. Um, and it's available for pre-order on our website. So 11 composition lessons for photographing nature's small scenes. So the exact types of photographs that I just talked about. And then TJ has some beginning to end video processing tutorials, including the photo on the left, which I believe is have a good day, which is the reason for the code. So his code for 20% off of his tutorials is have a good day all one word, and I'll be sending out all of this information afterwards too. So you don't have to make notes unless you want to. And then Alex has his processing tutorials on sale as well. Uh, this is his trio, so uh, three trees, his videos for showing his start to finish process for three trees, and his code is nature rocks. So Alex is nature rocks, TJ is have a good day, and mine is no code but an ebook for pre-order. And again, I'll send all of that out with the, the notes from the session. So now we can turn to Jennifer and she can facilitate our Q&A. All right, thank you all three. The comments are very positive and inspiring. Everyone is very thankful. Everyone did such a nice job. So many good little facets of information there. So good job to all three of you. So we have 
quite a bit of questions. And just to let you guys know, um, Alex and TJ, since they went first, um, they were able to go ahead and answer some of the questions in the Q&A. So you might want to head over there and check to see if they answered some. Um, I know there were some questions about tripods and lenses. So they kind of took those questions and answered them in there. So go ahead and double check in there if it already to see if it's already been answered. And we're going to go in no particular order, but we're actually going to start with um, a question for Sarah from Brent. So Brent would like to know, Sarah, when you shoot your smaller scenes, do you tend to consciously compose using your tripod or do you crank up the ISO and take a ton of frames handheld? Mm -hmm. That's the first part of his question. Okay. Um, for for shallow depth of field types of scenes where experimentation is really important and I'm physically moving in and out towards my subject, I often do bump up the ISO so that I can experiment a lot. And then if I find a composition where I feel like I need to refine what I'm working on, then I will get out my tripod. For a lot of the little detail scenes that I showed in, that were not shallow depth of field, the likelihood is those are definitely tripod and often focus stacked. And with focus stacking, you can do it without a tripod, but I generally tend much more towards precision. So uh, I almost always start without my tripod, experimenting, kind of testing perspectives, looking at the different lighting, so moving around a subject and getting a sense of how it looks best. And then once I get an idea, I'll take a couple of test photographs, and then I'll set up my tripod and refine a scene because I generally find that I'm better when I refine a scene as long as the light isn't changing. If the light is changing, then I'm just doing whatever it takes to move quickly. Okay, perfect. And his, the second part of his question is, when you use a shallow depth of field, do you consciously choose particular points to focus on or do you choose a variety of points and choose your favorite frame later on your computer. And he adds, I definitely spray and, pay, spray and pray, but aspire to choose compositions more thoughtfully. So I would answer the question differently from what I do to what I would recommend people starting out do. So if you're just starting to experiment with shallow depth of field, take a lot of exposures, test a lot of different focus points, experiment, because you'll have no idea initially what will work. So when I'm taking a photo now that I've been doing this for years, I have a pretty good sense of what will work. Uh, but I still experiment quite a bit. It just, I can hone in on the focus point that I think will work best generally pretty quickly. But experiment, experiment, experiment. It's definitely, with shallow depth of field, moving just a millimeter in some cases on a really small subject can render a totally different impression of a plant or a flower or an abstract subject. Thank you, Sarah. So now we're going to move on to Jennifer Lee. Ha, I laugh because my middle name is Lee and it's spelled just like that. So I feel like I typed this question, but I did not. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes me giggle. So she would like to know, and this was directed to Alex when he got started um, with his presentation. She would like to know, how do you make subjects such as trunks separate from the forest that's behind it and around it? So how do you make those pop? Um. There are a lot of ways you can do that, Jennifer. Uh, I would say that it would start in the field by the natural contrast. So your tree trunks might be a lot darker than the foliage and forest surrounding them. So they might stand out naturally, or you might wait until there are light on the trunks. So the, the side lighting on the trunks might highlight them while the rest of the forest is in shadow. Um, you can also do a lot of cloning and posts to remove little distractions. You can use vignetting. Um, you can use selective contrast, so you can make areas that you want attention to be drawn more contrasty and uh, kind of lower the contrast or saturation in areas where you don't want the focus, like the uh, chaotic background or surroundings. There are a lot of ways you can do it, but I guess most important is the natural uh, appearance of a subject and the light. So I showed a couple examples. I showed one of winter uh, aspen trees where they were very bright and they were side lit. And then I showed another where those same types of trees were actually just being used as silhouettes uh, against the brighter background. So it really depends on the scene and the light. But I would say it starts with that and then there are some tricks you can use in post as well. Okay, thank you, Alex. Mm -hmm. So um, here's a question for TJ. 
So Bruce wants to know, TJ, do you have a preferred shutter speed for your ripples and water reflections? No, it, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of it just depends on, um, <clears throat> number one, what I'm trying to do, and number two, how fast the water is moving. So it's a pretty difficult question to answer, um, you know, I sh but I do shoot anywhere from, you know, I've shot uh, waterfalls um, falling the actual water at like one two thousandth of a second, you know, all the way up to, you know, one second on uh, some smaller scenes or, you know, depending on what the light's doing. So, you know, I, the, the short answer is no, there's no, like, I don't start anywhere. I think, you know, if I'm trying to freeze, I'm either trying to freeze water or I'm trying to use the texture or I'm trying to, uh, get a little bit of texture to somewhat frozen, um, a somewhat frozen shot. So yeah, I don't, I think if I, you know, if I were, depending on how fast the water is moving, if I were trying to stop the water, I'd probably pick somewhere around uh, one two hundredth of a second or something like that. Um, in my general water creek scene shots where I want a little bit of texture in the water, my shutter speed is usually under a second, but for my water abstract work, it really depends. I, I really like, um, you know, one of my favorite things to photograph is the interaction of light and water. And I find that you get really interesting results when you point directly at the brightest light or the fastest water or the combination of the two and then freeze that action. You can get some really interesting things happening. So, you know, like I said, you know, it's not for me, it's not about getting that photo. It's about exploring that water and and learning uh, its intricacies and the way it behaves and the way it flows and its rhythms and things like that. And I'm just using my camera as a way to explore it. So I'm always moving my shutter speed back and forth and seeing what I like. But um, again, just uh, pick a shutter speed and start exploring. Excellent. Thank you, TJ. So this next question, I'm actually going to throw out to the three of you because it's a fairly quick answer question um, and then combine it with a question from the same person for Sarah um, along the same lines. But first of all, do all of you change your ISO often or do you stay on auto ISO and let the camera make the choice? So let's start with TJ. Completely manual. Um, you know, I, I try to shoot as low as possible. Uh, you know, Typically, ISO is one of the uh, last things that I budge on in terms of the three settings. I'm usually, I think my, my uh, yeah, I'm usually using a, a blend of the shutter speed and the aperture to get the, you know, the texture or whatever I want. Um, and if I can't get that, then I'm boosting the ISO. But is, do cameras have auto ISO? They do. <laughs> they do. I, they I just never use this. it. <laughs> the only auto thing that I use is auto white balance. Um, but everything else I just do manually. Yeah, I'm totally manual. Aperture and shutter speed can actually affect your image creatively, so they're important, like what you want in focus or don't want in focus and how much movement you want. And then the ISO is just the lowest you can get away with within those parameters creatively. So yeah, the ISO is the last thing I set. And I wouldn't trust the camera to set it auto because it may blow the highlights somewhere that you don't want. Or um, ISO really is just the last thing you should be thinking about when you're thinking about exposure think first about how much light you're letting in like how big the hole is so the aperture and then how uh, long it's open so the shutter speed i agree okay and then sarah um she specifically asked or she wanted to know what your iso is for many of your softer looking exposures um, if it's on a tripod, as low as it can go, given the conditions. If it's windy, I'll bump it, bump it up to 400 or 800. If I'm hand holding my camera, then 400 is probably like where I generally start uh, because that usually gives me a fast enough shutter speed. If it's windy or it's dark, then I'll bump it up even more. But generally, I try to stay 400 or below. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, this next one is for Alex. Alice asks, are these, are these images you specifically go out for or more scenes you see while out for other photographic subjects? I, I want to combine this with the other question from Alice too um, about whether I changed my lens or if I moved my position to get yes. that uh, shot of the trees behind the lake uh, in the mountains. Um, 
I first of all, the first question, I don't go out looking for anything in particular usually, and this is something that I've adopted from Sarah. Uh, she's kind of, at least as far as I know, the progenitor of the wandering around technique of photography. Just wander and observe and see what uh, grabs your eye and see what interests you and what the light's doing. Um, don't go out with preconceived notions of what exact image you should make because then you're making uh, you're putting yourself in a box and you're you're going to get tunnel vision and you're going to miss opportunities so all these images that i showed um i would say most of them were not premeditated at all and i was just driving or hiking and i saw something that the light was doing or saw some subject that that grabbed me and then uh, worked the composition until i made a compelling image and then I wanted to add on, uh, Alice also asked if I changed the lens or changed my position. And Sandy asked a very similar question. Is most of the exclusion of these scenes done with just cropping? Uh, I feel like that may have been confusing in my presentation. I'm not taking a huge shot and then cropping into 10% of it. A couple of other people asked about this too. Um, I was trying to show you the whole scene with like a cell phone shot of the scene but I'm actually shooting with a telephoto lens. I'm changing my position as necessary. So on that lake shot, I did walk around the lake to get closer to the trees. Um, I'm changing my perspective and my lens and my framing to fill the frame with the subject. I'm not just taking a big shot and cropping in later. Okay, great. And this next one I'm gonna send over to TJ. So, I just lost my spot. So Gregory would like to know, are there any tips? Now he's talking about East Coast forests, um, but I think it could apply to West Coast forests as well. And he wants to know, are there any tips for forests during the summer and finding unique images in the wall of green? You know, I, I think, so my, my, most, um, my most successful forest photography has come when I'm not looking. You know, I think, and I think that's a kind of an important thing, maybe for all three of us, but I know it's important for me that, you know, the, my favorite shots are the ones that I wasn't looking for and they're the ones that I thought about the least. And, you know, I will go to Olympic National Park and be there for three or four days before I actually pull out my camera. So I think there's a lot to be said for photographing in a place where you feel comfortable and connected to. And, you know, with forests being very, very hard to shoot, um, you know, understanding uh, that connection that you have with it um, can really lead you in the right direction. And then when it comes to, you know, just photographing forests in general, you know, as Alex was saying, and, you know, an overarching theme of forests is that they're very disorganized and they're very chaotic. Um, so sometimes it just takes uh, throwing on a longer telephoto lens to isolate the uh, organization that you can find. So, you know, yes, I do shoot forests in the summer, in the spring, when they're lush. 99% um, of my time when I'm shooting forest, my 70 to 300 millimeter telephoto is on. And I'm doing different things with, uh, you know, depth of field. Um, you know, if I have a lot of layers of trees above my camera and then some leaves and branches that are further away, I can kind of obscure my lens with those leaves and those branches and focus on the ones that are further away. And you get some really dreamy, um, some kind of dreamy shots because you're kind of diffusing everything through that softness and just using backlight, you know, back, there's that translucence of the leaves and everything, you know, the light shining through the leaves, like focusing on that. So, you know, it is, yes, it's a wall of green, but there are details within that wall of green that can engage you and intrigue you as long as you're in a place where, you know, you're letting the forest speak to you rather than you going out and trying to find things. Cause when you're trying to find things, you're, you know, you have blinders on. I remember uh, that shot that, Alex showed from Olympic National Park. That was one of the first times that I shot a forest. And I remember being so overwhelmed because I was completely in that results-driven approach where I was looking for something to photograph. And I'm looking for the big scenes. And then I get frustrated because I'm walking past all the small scenes. And then I'm looking for the small scenes. And I get frustrated because I'm walking past all the big scenes. And it's just like, you know, don't go out. And for me, you know, I don't go out to photograph. I just go out and photographs happen. So, um, just throw on your telephoto lens, poke around, explore, take crappy photos, and you know you're gonna you're gonna find something that speaks to you. All right, thank you, TJ. This one's going out to Sarah. So this is from Josh, and he would like to know what your tripod head setup for getting your camera into the low to the ground, pointed straight down position is. Um, I have a an enduro tripod that doesn't have any fancy anything. 
So it's just, I have a short center column that allows me to get as close as my macro lens will allow, sort of spreading the legs out as far as they'll go and then dropping the ball head into the notch so that I can face straight down and then sitting on the ground and working with things. So nothing fancy at all. I don't have any of the fancy telescoping heads or the reversible ball heads, any of the reversible columns. I just use a really simple setup. <laughs> all right. Thank you. And then um, there was a question here. I just lost it. I'm scrolling. So pardon me for taking a second here. Um, oh, it's gone. Maybe one of you guys grabbed that. It was just about focus stacking. I was just going to quickly have all three of you just say in a few words what your favorite software is, but it appears to be gone. Okay. Um, what'd you say, TJ? I use Helicon. Okay. Yeah. Do you guys just want to shout it out just in case other people were wondering? So I'm a big fan of Photoshop. I think okay. Photoshop's good. <laughs> for, for focus stacking? Yeah, for focus stacking, Alex. Oh, I didn't hear the rest of the question. I'm sorry. Photoshop? No, Helicon is good, <laughs> but uh, you can do it in Photoshop, too. It just might take some more touch-up. The, the, the issue with uh, focus stacking in Photoshop um, is that it make it, it, it off. Well, yeah, if you have stationary subjects, it might be fine, but I often find that it makes mistakes in the way that... Um, it masks all the images together, it's near impossible to find out. If you see an area that might need to be touched up, it's near impossible to go through all the different layers and levels of masks that they have to find what you need to fix. But in Helicon, you know, and it's like, it can be pricey. I think it, the, the lifetime license is what, like $150 or something like that. I remember being like, oh, like I remember being hesitant to spend the money, but um, it saves time and it saves frustration, both, uh, you know, Frustration is a huge, um, huge thing that works against creativity. So the less that I'm spending time doing the, that, that, that kind of that kind of work, um, the more time I can spend on making the photo look how I want. You know, those are just the you know, very basic level of getting the base of the photo together. And then you can spend the rest of your time on your creativity. So I totally um, vouch for Helicon. Um, if it does make a mistake, you can go through any of your files that you supplied and just brush that area in super easily. And then it also outputs a raw file. I haven't tested the raw file super, super hard. Like I haven't pushed it really hard in either direction because my processing is usually uh, pretty subtle. But um, yeah, it, it, it spits out a raw file, which uh, you can't do in Photoshop. All right. Can I just add that uh, every single workshop and presentation and everything I get a lot of questions about focus stacking and it's really like I don't think I showed any images that are focus stacked in this presentation. I try to get everything in one shot if possible and it is often possible at f16 um, you know before diffractions too big of an issue. So it's, it's not a huge deal unless you're dealing with macro or something really close to your lens or super long focal lengths. Okay um. And then Sarah, I, I, I don't want to answer for you, but <laughs> what's your favorite focus stacking software? Even though I probably know. Helicon Focus by far. <laughs> All right. And then I'm going to throw um, kind of a mix of questions at you, Sarah, just because a lot of people are kind of wondering the same thing. Thing. So I'm just going to try to group it all together. Um, first, another Sarah wanted to know, and I wrote down specifically what shot she was talking about. Um, it was the slide with your pine cone shot. She was wondering if those were macro shots. This is the most common question I get whenever I show small scenes and I, so no, it wasn't. I use every lens in my bag for all the types of photos I was showing. So I have a 1635 wide angle, 24 to 105 mid range zoom, a hundred to 400 and a hundred millimeter macro lens. And the photos that I showed today used every single one of those lenses. So I have a macro lens. But unless it's a really tiny detail that I want to get really close to, I use one of the other lenses because the zoom lens is so much more flexible and easy to use that I just personally find it more pleasurable to photograph with. Okay, thank you. Yes, that answered quite a few people's questions there. They were super curious about your lenses. All right, this one's going to Alex. So how do you decide how much of trunks, like tree trunks, should be in the frame, especially if you're not showing the whole tree? And he understands that it probably varies according to the scene, but he's just trying to understand if you have a general approach for this purpose. Um, there's no 
there's no amount that should be in the frame. It just depends on what your goal is with the composition and on the scene, obviously. So I'm usually trying to exclude the sky. So depending on whether I can get higher than the trees and look down on them or whether I'm in the trees looking up, like that might determine wherever I want to exclude the sky, that might determine the top of the tree. And then whether I'm trying to portray the whole scene, like an entire forest floor with the foliage below the trunks, then I would want to include the bottom of the trunks because you want to see where they terminate and see how the forest floor comes up around them. Or if it's a more intimate or even abstract shot that's just about the shape of the trunks, then I might exclude the floor and the sky and just have like a, a section of trunks. It really depends on what your goal is with the composition. So there's no hard and fast answer there, but it's really all about excluding distractions within the type of shot that I'm trying to make. All right, thank you, Alex. Um, Ron has a question and I'm gonna throw this out to TJ since you currently live in the Pacific Northwest where you probably see a bit of this. Um, he wants to know, have you ever photographed the trees of logging operations either during or after or even long after with the new growth? He says we have a lot of these in the foothills of the Rockies so he's just interested in some thoughts. Tons of clear cuts in Oregon. Um, uh, no, um, you know, I, you know, what what gets me in nature and what inspires me in nature is the, uh, just the, the raw beauty of the forest in itself. You know, I, in most of my photos, I try to um, omit any semblance of the hand of man. So buildings or people, or um, I think I have one shot, uh, I have a couple shots with people in them. Um, in one shot with a path in it, but generally it's that, uh, it's just like that, that kind of, that wilderness vibe is what I want to portray in my photos. Like, you know, even, you know, I have a shot from, and I know this isn't trees, but I have a shot from Multnomah Falls that you wouldn't know that it's Multnomah Falls and that I was surrounded um, by, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people. It was like, it was like a weekend. I had to work on a project, so that's why I was there. But, um, you know, it's, I, I like to portray that that sense of wilderness and that sense of beauty and that sense of calm. Um, and that's not what necessarily comes across in clear cuts. Um, that being said, um, you can, you know, one a, a really good thing to shoot is the edges of forest. Cause you know, when you're in the forest, you know, there are different levels of trees and like I said, it's messy and chaotic, but when you're shooting the edge of a forest, like from across the river, or, you know, say you kind of just have uh, all these tree trunks that are the same kind of like the same uh, distance away that you can pick all your different scenes out of and the edges of clear cuts uh, have that too and i have uh, one image on my website titled uh um, tree hugs um, that is on the edge of a clear cut and it's, it's just these really tall trees they look so incredibly tall because like alex said you know i omitted the bottom and i omitted the top so they just look really tall and there's um, the branches on the sides of them um, were kind of sheared off by the logging so you just got the trunks and then the rest of the uh, forest behind it. Um, so that would be as close as I get to photographing a logging operation. But um, I, know, I know that there, there are people that are kind of more focused on a wilderness uh, advocacy aspect of their photography that uh, go out and try to um, capture the logging operations and such like that in uh, beautiful ways. And they're really good at it, but it's not something I do. Okay, thanks TJ. Um, so next, this is a question for Sarah from Mark. Um, he wants to know with, from your photo of the single sprig of the oak or maple leaf, did you experiment with different focus points to have several to choose from later on? With that particular photo, I worked for a really long time on the composition, but once I had figured out the composition, like the framing and the, the angle, because I was sitting on a steep slope and like getting into position was kind of complicated. But once I was, had figured all those pieces out, I think I probably focused kind of on one of the front leaves, one of the middle leaves and the stem. And I think the stem is probably what I ended up choosing. I, I often choose like a, a leaf, like a single leaf to focus on or a single stem and then let the rest fall out of focus. So that's generally how I would how I would work with that kind of scene where it's kind of a complicated and uncomfortable setup. I wouldn't try a lot because it was just not physically possible. Uh, but in in other cases where it's easier, I might try more examples. But okay. in that is generally like try try a leaf 
and a STEM and see where, how things look and then go from there. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so this next question I'm going to toss out to Alex. Um, Jack wants to know what circumstances do you reach for a circular polarizer? And I'm not sure if he means in general or he maybe means with the forest scenes. Um, well, the forest is usually where I'm using the polarizer. Uh, I'll pull it out almost all the time when I'm shooting a lot of foliage because you usually have um, kind of semi-reflective leaves that are uh, going to turn white in your exposures essentially and become distracting and they'll lose their color, their natural color, um, if you don't use a polarizer to cut those reflections. So it really, uh, in the forest, is a helpful tool to bring out the vibrance that you're seeing with your eyes and uh, eliminate glare on individual leaves. And uh, I mean, I know there are situations where you'd want to use it where you'd want to remove a reflection or haze in the distance, uh, especially uh, if you're 90 degrees away from the sun and shooting a long telephoto of something far away, then the polarizer is going to cut that haze significantly. Um, but as, as, as it pertains to trees, I just use it to make the foliage more vibrant. And uh, maybe there's some situation shooting like a water reflection where you'd want to cut part of the reflection. But um, I find that usually if you're shooting a reflection, it's because of the reflection and you don't want to lose it. So I'm um, really just using it for foliage most of the time. Jennifer, did you just? That's it. Oh, yeah, she's uh, yeah, yeah, she's muted. Huh? Just kidding. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was drinking water and I didn't want to have an episode where it goes down the wrong tube like I usually do when I'm live. So, <laughs> all right. So we have just a few more questions left here. Um, we'll try to answer these quickly since we're at about the two hour mark. So I'm just going to kind of throw this out to, I'm just going to pick you guys randomly. Um, so TJ, um, do you have a particular brand of Phil? of ND filters that you like to use? And does one need a three, six, and a 10 stop? I, I like I said, I'm not, I'm not big on uh, filters. Um, I find them cumbersome and uh, a lot of times unnecessary, it's, at least when it comes to um, ND filters or you know, especially GND filters. Um, I, I use a Hoya HD3 polarizer and uh, hopefully soon I'll be uh, moving on to the breakthrough filters because they have a really good product and I've been uh, talking with them a little bit. Um, the only time I really pull out an ND filter is when I can't do what I want to do within the settings of my camera. And that's pretty rare. Uh, usually shooting into the sun at sunset um, on the beach when I want a little bit of water motion would be one of the few times that I pull out an ND filter. Um, unless I'm doing something uh, creative with a 10 stop or something like that. But um, yeah, I don't have a particular brand that I'm a, a kind of a loyal to yet. Another instance where they would be useful is trying to create motion from wind when it's too bright to do that long of an exposure. Um, and that's kind of what I was trying in that uh, one shot where I showed it was a bunch of the different, um, or it was like that, it was the wind wash photo where it was the, the, the trees being moved by wind. Um, I think I had a, a four stop on for that. Yeah. Um, but I will say that, you know, when it comes to circular polarizers, uh, you know, if you're doing a lot of water photography, spend the extra money for um, the ones with good coatings, the, especially that are hydrophobic, because um, when you get a waterfall spray on your lens, you can actually take your rocket blower and blow it off the front of your lens rather than using a lens cloth that um, either just smears it or gets saturated and then you have to get a new lens cloth and a new lens cloth. Um, but if you have a hydrophobically clo uh, coated um, polarizer, you can just, a couple blows of your rocket blower just beads right off. It's impressive that you had that right there, TJ. I, don't, yeah. I know, I'm very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we just, uh, I don't know why it's on my desk. But we went out yesterday and I had it and I guess I didn't put my gear away because it's also here and this was just part of the belt. So. TJ has his bag of props right there. I have them, I have them everywhere. Just so in case I'm, 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 all right, thanks, TJ. Um, one more for Sarah here. Um, Connie just wants to know how you get that kind of soft, focused, dreamy look on many of your photos. Um, she's wondering if you're overexposing. I use a very thin slice of focus, so f2.8, or um, I just got a lens baby lens that has an even thinner slice of focus. I often photograph through things, so photographing through a bunch of leaves to my subject, and that helps add that dreamy look. 
I process things very light and bright in Photoshop, which adds that dreamy look too. So um, it's a combination of in the field practices and then things in processing. I think a lot of people assume that with things like, like photos of a sprig of leaves, that the processing is really simple. Like you're just going to do like a little tiny levels adjustment to bring a pop of contrast back and then you're done. But you can take a creative approach to processing those kinds of photos just like you can with any other uh, photo, any photo of nature. So I do some creative processing on those photos too. Okay. And while you were answering that, we had two questions pop up for you that were the same. People are just wondering which lens baby lens do you have? Um, I got the Velvet 85 and the Sweet 50, no, the Composer Pro with the Sweet 50. I'm not, uh, the, the, the Sweet one or the Composer Pro, that combo, I'm not quite sure about yet, but I absolutely love the Velvet 85. I, I, I was resistant to getting a lens baby and then my friend Ann Belmont kept on encouraging me and I finally got one and it has been so much fun to play with. I've been using it a lot on bigger scenes too, and just doing really dreamy forest scenes. And it's been the most fun I've had with photography. I don't know if I'll ever share the fo photos, but oh my gosh, has it been so much fun. <laughs> and that's good. It's supposed to be fun. So yeah. That's, that's, hey, remember like that. fun? Remember when it was fun when you started <laughs> out? <laughs> okay, so we're just gonna hit about two more questions here. Um, so Lorraine was wondering if any of you take groups on tours of forests. And I know a lot of you, we all lead workshops and stuff, but do you have any coming up specifically for forest photography or in the next few months or next year even? Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to be at uh, the out of Acadia conference, assuming that it's still going in October in Acadia national park. I assume there will be a lot of forest photography there and Sarah will be there too. Um, and I, do lead workshops occasionally in forest areas, uh, but we're always careful to leave no trace and not trample the forest and stay on the trail, so. And we all lead workshops in Death Valley National Park, which has forests, Joshua Tree forests, higher elevation forests. Yeah, that's true. So it's not exactly <laughs> what you might expect from a forest, but we all love Death Valley, so. Yeah. Yes, definitely one of the surprises of Death Valley. Always keeps you on your toes. Last year and uh, this this year, we were uh, my friend Eric and I were going to do a uh, forest photography workshop in Olympic National Park, but we had to cancel due to the pandemic. Um, we haven't discussed next year yet, but uh, I know that forest photography and tree photography can be very challenging, and uh, I feel like it's something that I've unlocked a little bit for me. So um, I do intend to keep doing forest photography workshops, but when and where they happen uh, is to be undecided, is undecided right now. Okay, and then TJ, just while you're at it, someone just wanted to know really quickly what that brand was that you mentioned with the hydro coating. Uh, it's Kelly Boucheroon. Hey, Kelly. Um, it was uh, the Kelly. Hoya HD3. <laughs> Boucheroon is it. She taught me how to say it. <laughs> I'm it's glad fun. you said it. I wasn't going to try. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, guys. So we have just one, we have three questions left. We'll try to zoom through these really quick. So real quick, Sarah wants to know, um, for Sarah, is there a tutorial or ebook that details your processing? I have a black and white processing tutorial, but I don't think that's what Sarah is asking about. So no, but hopefully soon in the future, since I have all this time now. <laughs> All right, and then one real quick, just going out to all three of you, we'll keep it really short. What would be your favorite lens for small scenes and not so small scenes? Go TJ. Um, my favorite lens for small scenes and not so small scenes. Um, my Nikon AFP 70 to 300, uh, there's a newer version and an older version. It's the newer version. It's like $700, four and a half stops of uh, image stabilization. The optics are good, it's light. It's a variable aperture, so you don't get to tell people that you have an f2.8 lens. Um, uh, but yeah, that's 99% of the time on the front of my lens. And then the other 1% is probably my 16 to 35. Alex? Uh, I only have two lenses, the 24 to 105 and the 100 to 400. And it just depends on how close I am to the subject and, and how big of a subject it is. But like being in the forest, I would use the 24 to 105. If I'm focusing in on smaller details, probably the 100 to 400. Um, I use the 100 to 400 probably the most. 100 to 400. 
But <laughs> like Alex said, like use the right tool for what you're trying to convey about a scene. Hmm. But generally the 100 to 400, if I could only choose one lens, that would probably be it. I want a 50 to 500. Me too. F, I want a 50 F5.6. I want it to be light too. I don't need <laughs> wide apertures. What, what did you say, sir? You want a, um, a 50 to 800. Yeah, how about that? Why not? That'd be perfect. F8 yeah. too. You know, eight hundred dollars. Eight hundred and one. All right. If it was F2.8. It'd be like one hundred fifty pounds. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have one last question. Um, I'm just gonna throw it out to all three of you, and just like a real quick answer. When you're shooting, do you already have a sense of the mood, or do you bring that out through post processing? Um, I or oh. Alex, <laughs> whoever. Just trying to make it quick by jumping in. Um, it depends on the light. Like sometimes, if I'm shooting, some of those shots I showed were just about the light, where everything else falls into darkness relative to the light. Um, then I already kind of know in camera what it's going to look like. But there are other scenes that are way more open to interpretation, like when the light is softer, or you can uh, play with the color a lot more. Um, or get creative in post, then then I just like to play with it in post and see. Um, it just depends on how cut and dry the original scene and light were and how much room there is for interpretation. TJ? Um, I can't think of the last time I thought about processing in the field other than, God, I got a focus stack. Um, <laughs> I think that's the only time I ever really That just makes that. me quit. <laughs> yeah, like, shooting that shot like, that's not worth it <laughs> yes i'll do it but um yeah no i don't i don't think about processing in the field and most of the time my images just kind of sit on my hard drive until uh they tell me when to process them and i just go with wherever i'm feeling sarah any thoughts i i don't i agree i I focus stack more now that i have a touch screen because it's more seamless and it doesn't interrupt my process but Aside from that, like, as long as you know what your capabilities are in processing, I don't think, like, beyond very essential technical decisions, I think as long as you have a good file, you'll be able to take it in a lot of different ways when you get back. So but that's usually all I think about and then know that I'll just apply my general approach to the yeah. yeah, that's good advice. Just make sure you have a good file and get it as clean and sharp as you can within the parameters of the scene. and worry about those creative decisions later. All right. Well, thank you all three of you. Um, in the comments, I'm going to end with what Simone just said. She said, you guys rock. <laughs> so that's a good way to sum this up. Everyone says it was terrific and very inspiring. So really nice job, guys. Thank Can you we all. mention one more thing, Jennifer, about yes. our webinar? So David Kingham, Jennifer Renwick, Sarah Marino, talking about composition for small scenes on June 11th, 4 p.m. Mountain Time. We hope you'll register for that as well, and we'll send out information um, after this webinar. So thank you so much, Alex and TJ, for being co-presenters today, and for David and Jennifer for helping out, and for so many people sticking with us for two hours yeah. talking yeah. about trees. When I told TJ how many people were registered, he's like, there's no way that that many people want to hear us talk about trees. Like, but they stuck with us. <laughs> <laughs> who are you people? <laughs> but, I mean, I, I know that it's... Uh, yeah, it can get pretty dry sometimes, um, but I think if you're really interested in it and it's something that, you're, uh, that you want to improve on, um, then it's easy to stay invested in it. Thank so, you for coming, everyone, and thanks thank for sticking around. Too. And thank you, Sarah and David and Jennifer, for putting it together. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Bye, every, bye all participants and attendees. We appreciate it. Bye. Yes. Thank stay you. Stay safe, everybody. <laughs>